The Young Avengers. One of Marvel's premier kid super teams right up there with the Champions, Power Pack, the Runaways, the New Mutants, Generation X, the New Warriors, the Next Avengers, the Young X-Men, Academy X, the Future Foundation, the Initiative, the Fallen Angels, Avengers Academy, the Loners, the Secret Warriors, kind of, the original Hellions, and of course Xavier's School for Gifted Youngsters, just generally. Yes, Kevin Feige, my boss, I, Nando, the YouTuber who secretly writes all the Marvel movies, have been banging on about this for a while. Marvel should make a movie that brings together all of the kid characters. So I was thrilled when you sent me this email that said, Hey Nando, it's Kevin Feige. I'm sure you heard the big Marvel news of the week of November 9th. I'm a Lego now. They're making me into a Lego minifigure in the new Avengers Tower set. Isn't that incredible? Also, we might not do Kang stuff anymore. Anyway, I've been thinking it's finally time to make that kid team up. Do you have a pitch for a Young Avengers movie? Absolutely, Kevin. I would love to pitch a Young Avengers movie. After all, I already made a video called What Do We Do With All These Avenger Babies and a follow-up video on my second channel, The Nando Cut, now on Nebula, with all the kids I forgot. This team should happen soon. And after the Marvels, it seems like we're going to start making moves on a Young Avengers something. Probably a movie, since this could make money, although who knows. So, let's say we're making a Young Avengers movie today, using the characters that have already been introduced or are about to be introduced. What does that movie look like? What's your team? What's the plot? And what relationships within the team are going to make this interesting? Well, I've got a pitch. Now for this pitch, I'm going to take the characters that seem most likely to be on this team and try to fit them together. Because some of the characters would probably work better on a college-aged team of Young Avengers, and some of them would probably work better on a high school-aged team of Champions. But just based on what we're doing, Young Avengers with all those characters together seems like what you want. So in this video, Kevin, which you shouldn't share with anyone because if you do, you'll have to change it or maybe never make this movie, who knows? I'm going to go over the characters and the plot. I don't want to give too much away right off the bat and there isn't much you need to know. It helps if you've seen the Marvels, but only so much as you know that like Kamala doesn't die in it at the end and she still wants to be a superhero. I wrote this pitch before I knew how Loki ended, which is helpful because I've seen the finale and I'm still not sure what that actually was. Like. Holding the strands, what does that do? Why do they kind of change color a little bit when he touches them? Can he see into the strands? Can he not? Is Kang a thing anymore? Like, I just don't know. The only other thing that's important is that it seems pretty likely that Wanda's kids are going to show up again. And rumors point to Heartstopper's Joe Locke playing a young adult Billy in the Agatha and the Darkhold Coven of Harkness or whatever it's called. This feels right, and I have a feeling we'll find out about this officially long before the series airs. I don't know what happens in the show, but let's just say like he exists when we're making this movie. But yeah, let's jump into it. After the events of the Marvels, Kamala and Kate team up to stop a crime. We get to throw a D-lister in here, so let's say it's Mr. Hyde. He's rampaging through New York and Kamala and Kay try to stop him, but they sort of whiff it. Not a complete disaster, nobody dies, but they cause a lot of property damage and Mr. Hyde gets away. Sam and the rest of the Avengers get together to figure out what to do with them. They have powers and skills that make them an asset, but they're not trained and without supervision are deemed a danger to themselves and others. But Scott has an idea. These kids are doing their own thing because they cannot be Avengers yet, but what if the Avengers established a training program for the kids where they could learn to work together out of the public eye? Then when the time comes, they'd be ready, but also the Avengers could make sure nobody actually gets hurt in the meantime. Some of the Avengers object. Spider-Man thinks they need to make mistakes in the field to really learn. Shuri, being only a few years older than some of them, doesn't think they'll take the invitation. But Sam understands that if they don't, President Ross and Val will put in another version of the Sokovia Accords that will end up with all of the Avengers in jail. They need to do something. So the Young Avengers initiative is created. And yeah, I think we call it Young Avengers. After all, it's young, not kid. And Tony was in his 40s when he joined the team. Thor was thousands of years old. Bruce was in his 40s. And the current Avengers are all at least 30 except Spider-Man, but nobody knows that. So these young Avengers are all of the college ages and under Avengers. When you turn 30, you get invited to the big leagues. And I'm gonna call them kids in this video, mostly because I think anybody younger than me is a kid. And that name can be a sticking point within the group. These guys can resent the name Young Avengers. Why do they have to be Young Avengers? Why are the Avengers treating them like babies? They deserve respect. They've all beaten villains that would give the regular Avengers trouble. Kamala stopped Darben, Kate beat Kingpin, and Stature helped beat Kang. She-Hulk hasn't even done anything on that level, and she's on the team. On Shuri's recommendation, Sam also asks Riri to join the team. So Kate and Kamala join Riri on the West Coast to become part of this program. And then there's Cassie. Scott thinks Cassie should join this team. She was originally interested enough to build a super suit, and she was pretty good at being an ant person in the quantum realm. She beat MODOK. 
This is perfect for her. But perhaps Cassie's experience in the quantum realm did genuinely scare her. She got kidnapped, her dad almost died, and Cassie building the quantum beacon was what got everybody in trouble in the first place. Cassie blames herself and thinks this superhero life is nothing but trouble. And Cassie's also sort of in a rut. She graduated high school but doesn't have any job or direction. So Scott talks with her mom and Paxton and they agree that this could be good for Cassie. She can get out of the house, make some new friends, and maybe do some good. So that's our four. A Marvel, a Hawkeye, an Iron Person, and an Ant Person. But who trains these kids? Well, I think it's time to bring in White Vision. In the comics, Vision was a Young Avengers team member, although for different reasons, and he even played a role in that next Avengers movie. I think this is a sensible place to put White Vision, especially because the Avengers don't want him out on missions either, since the world associates him with Wanda, who is remembered as a villain. And if the team is on the West Coast, maybe when this is all done, they stop calling themselves the Young Avengers and start calling themselves the West Coast Avengers. Which feels right, since the recent West Coast Avengers run was a team of younger heroes led by Kate Bishop. So our four Young Avengers and Vision go to the Young Avengers base and start training. And right off the bat, we have some friendships starting and some rivalries. And this is where the development matrix comes in. But it's not the same as the last time. This is the new development matrix. If you remember, in my Midnight Suns pitch, I talk about this tool for organizing team-ups called the Development Matrix. It is a spreadsheet where you write all the characters' names on both axes and in the intersections, you come up with something that those characters have in common. It can be a trait or an experience or a hobby or a fear. It doesn't matter. We just need to figure out some things that bond our characters so that in this team-up, they're having unique experiences that can only be facilitated by this specific group of people. That's the whole game. They don't just learn things from each other, they learn things they can only learn from each other. But I think you see a problem. As it currently exists, half of the matrix is redundant since intersections happen twice. And originally, I just repeated the board on the other side. But I realized there's something else we can do. The top right intersections above the X line can be for commonalities, things that characters can bond over. But the bottom left can cover sources of friction. Like for instance, let's say Kate and Kamala both have lots of experience, so even though they share traits like being Avengers fangirls and living on the East Coast, a source of friction can be that they both think they should be the team leader. So that's what the other half of the board is for. So let's go over Kamala, Kate, Cassie, and Riri. We'll get to the other characters eventually. Kamala, Kate, and Cassie were all actively mentored by an Avenger. Riri spent time with Shuri, but I don't think it's quite the same thing. Kamala and Kate are both Avengers fangirls. Kamala and Kate are both headquartered in the tri-state area. Cassie, Kate, and Riri all appear to be college-aged. Cassie and Riri are both inventors. Kate and Cassie both grew up without a father. Kamala and Riri shoot energy blasts. Kamala and Cassie can change their shape. Kamala and Riri both had serious run-ins with authority, damage control, and the CIA. Sure, Cassie was arrested, but the other two got shot at. Kamala and Riri have both gone viral. Kate, Cassie, and Riri appear to be only children. Kate and Cassie both have very nice stepdads. Kamala and Cassie have both had multiverse-related adventures. Kamala, Kate, and Cassie all have pets. Goose the Flurk and Lucky the Pizza Dog and the Ant. That's just a few connections between the characters. Now let's look at some friction. And this doesn't all need to be things that are true now, just things that could be true. Like Kamala and Kate both thinking their experience means they should lead the team. Or Kate being envious of Kamala's powers. Kamala could feel inferior to the other three older heroes. Riri could feel like an outsider because she does not have the kind of close relationship with the Avenger that the other three do. Kamala and Kate could feel inferior because they are not geniuses. Kate could feel weak as the Hawkeye in this group of superpowered characters. Kamala can envy Kate's relationship with Hawkeye, one of the original six Avengers. Riri, who seemed to make money selling test answers, could envy Kate's rich upbringing. Maybe Kamala and Kate are pushing Cassie to do more superhero stuff than she feels comfortable doing. And some of these can come up immediately and some can boil up later. Like during a training montage, Kamala, Cassie, and Riri can all be easily destroying fake Ultron drones, but Kate runs out of arrows and has a much harder time dealing with one drone by herself. And you can tell she sort of feels inferior. Or Kate and Kamala can both give advice to the other Avengers based on their experience and step on each other's toes. Maybe Kate is trying to involve Cassie in coming up with moves they can do together, but Cassie turns them down. Maybe the kids talk about their superhero names and Cassie doesn't want to pick one because she feels uncomfortable with this whole superhero thing. But I imagine you may be noticing a problem. We know a lot about what Cassie does not like, but not much about what she does. That's because I think her character is sort of broadly defined. 
We've not spent much time with her and unlike Riri, she doesn't fit into a familiar archetype like Gearhead or Hustler. The most I can say about her is that she's a rebellious young adult, so I imagine they're going to need to add some character traits to Cassie. I also want to address something you might be thinking right now. You may be saying, hey, what about my favorite young Avenger? Whoever. Why aren't they in this story? Well first, there are three more Young Avengers who I haven't talked about yet, but maybe you saw the thumbnail and you know your guy is missing. The thing is, I just couldn't include everyone. Not in this first story. I needed to use the characters that we've spent the most time with and that make the most sense on a team like this. I mean, it's not like this doesn't happen all the time. You can make an Avengers movie without Wasp, or you can make an X-Men movie without Angel. I promise, by the end of this video, you'll be on board. Just stick with me. Either way, we need a threat for this team of four to face. And in a story like this, we also need to come up with a reason why our young heroes are the only ones that can deal with it. There are a couple of ways we can handle this. First one, the Avengers could all be gone, either imprisoned by a villain or on a mission of their own. Like maybe Doctor Strange takes the Avengers to the Dark Dimension to fight Dormammu or something like that. So everyone the Young Avengers would ask for help is busy. On one hand, this is pretty simple. My only issue is we run the risk of people seeing this movie and leaving going, they really yada 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 over a fun Avengers movie. Second option, the adults don't listen. Maybe the kids learn about something, but the proper Avengers don't help them. Perhaps there's red tape, or maybe they don't believe the kids, and the kids are forced to solve the problem on their own. This feels reasonable, but here we run the risk of making the Avengers look dumb. But that's not unprecedented. Another option, the older Avengers cannot see the threat. This is what the second Young Avengers run does. The mother monster is fully invisible to the adult characters. This is a bit simpler, but might run the risk of feeling silly. Also, if this is the case, where's Spider-Man or the other heroes under 30 who exist in universe? Another option, the kids can be taken somewhere far. Either on purpose or by accident, the kids find a threat and are transported to a new environment or planet or reality or time where they cannot call for help and need to solve this problem on their own. I honestly think this one is the most fun because it feels the cleanest. The Avengers are not involved and we get to introduce a new location. So our four young Avengers are training, but they have a big problem. They're not getting called into the field. They see Black Panther and Shang-Chi fighting the Serpent Society and get antsy. When's it going to be our turn? When are they going to take us seriously? Why are we at the kids' table when we've already proven ourselves? And this is where things get interesting. Vision gets a call. There's some sort of Avengers-level magic threat hitting all over the globe. Doctor Strange is coordinating a response and all the Avengers need to get out there ASAP. The kids say, all right, well, where do you need us? And Vision says, right here. Look after Avengers HQ in case anything else goes wrong. But we can help. It's not up to me. Doctor's orders. Everyone rolls their eyes. Vision flies through a wall out of the building and the four young Avengers are left alone. And they just hang out, you know? What do they do? Kate's flicking bottle caps. Kamala's reading a comic. Cassie's throwing a rubber ball against a wall like her dad did when he was under house arrest. Riri's working on her new armor. Her, I don't know, maybe they're all just on their phones. Until an alarm goes off. Someone's in the lobby. They all do a cool superhero entrance from outside or the stairs or whatever and land in the lobby, surrounding, ready to fight whoever this is, and it's America Chavez. Kamala recognizes her from the Gargantos attack and Fury's tablet. The young Avengers stand down. America's flustered. She asks, are you the Avengers? Cassie says, well, but Kamala butts in, yeah, we are. You're America Chavez, right? You're Doctor Strange's sidekick? Sort of, but yeah, you guys need to come with me now. Kamala says, all right, who do we need to hit? Cassie interrupts, give us one second, and the team goes into a huddle. Cassie asks, what are you doing? She needs our help. She needs the Avengers' help. And what are we? Young, young what? Exactly. This is what Vision told us to do. America overhears. Oh, you guys have Vision? He'd be super helpful. Just one sec. I'm with Cassie. Besides, what if this is a trap or something? You think she's a scroll? I don't know. Hey, real quick, do a superpower thing. America punches open a star-shaped portal and makes a face. The portal disappears. Thanks. Scrolls can't do that. I think. Kate, where are you at? Kate takes a breath. <sighs> this is what Vision told us to do. We waited at home and someone showed up looking for our help. We'll go and call the rest of them when we're in the air. Everyone agrees. They turn back to America. All right, we'll help you and we'll let the rest of the team know on the way. Young Avengers, nope, not yet. I'll prep the Quinjet. It's on autopilot, so you just give me some coordinates. Oh, we don't need that. America punches another portal to a neighborhood that's on fire, but blue fire. Oh, what did you think that was? A big star. Whatever, come on, we gotta go. 
America jumps through the portal. Everyone gets a little scared. It just dawned on them that something dangerous is on the other side of that portal and they are not ready. Kate picks up her bow, walks over to the portal, says, let's go. Kate jumps through and one by one the other three jump through and when they come out on the other side, they're in Westview or wherever Agatha and the whatever of whatever ends up taking place. Everything's a disaster. Wind is blowing like a hurricane. Blue fire is everywhere. Blue lightning strikes right in front of the kids. And far in the distance, they see a boy floating in the air, clearly out of it. He must be the cause of whatever this is. Kamala makes a force field to protect everyone, and America explains. Okay, so this is all coming from Wanda's kid, we think. Wanda the Scarlet Witch. Yeah, he's reincarnated or something, it doesn't matter. For some reason, he's overloaded and shedding magic energy everywhere. We need to get him to Kamartaj where Wong is preparing a spell that can neutralize his powers. So make another star portal. I can't get close enough. Don't you guys have those rings? Something about his magic is messing him up. I need you guys to get me close enough to kick him through one of my portals. Can you do that? Yeah, I can make a shield and then the rest of us can push it. Once we're close enough, you'll have one shot to make your portal and we'll knock him through. Sound good? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. Okay. Kamala makes a shield that protects the team from the magic energy. Cassie and Riri each grab an end of the force field and all push forward. Cassie grows, Riri flies, and maxes out her jet boots. Kamala and America just put a shoulder into it and push. And America Chavez has like some form of super strength. I don't think this has ever been made explicitly clear besides that she can punch through that wall, but like she is also very strong and can kind of fly. Kate looks around and asks, what can I do? Push! And the five of them push the shield to the boy. The closer they get, the more powerful the magic energy gets. They're nearly knocked back, but they get close enough that America is able to jump beyond the shield and kick a big star portal behind the boy. But something's off. The portal's edges are wobbly. There's interference, and you can't see through it. The portal is black. That looks different. You're right. I made it to go to Kamartaj. His energy must be messing with it. We gotta get him out of here before he destroys the town. We don't know what's gonna happen if he goes through that thing. We have to do something. Shield's coming down, we're gonna miss our shot. Fine, do it. And Kamala uses her heart light fist to punch the boy through the portal. He disappears. The portal closes, everything goes back to normal. The team breathes a sigh of relief. All right, cool. I gotta get back to Wong so he can, but then the portal slowly begins to flicker and it opens again. Is it supposed to do that? No, run. The team tries to run, but one by one, they're all sucked through the portal and they fly through a colorful void and land somewhere. Now I know what you're thinking. This is a lot like how Quantumania starts. But A, Quantumania didn't work incredibly well, so I'm fine with taking another shot at it. And B, where they're going is very specific and might as well have its own subgenre. It would be like saying, well, Endgame shouldn't have time travel because Doctor Strange already did that. If you use it differently enough, it can work. So again, before I say where we're going, I want to reinforce some themes. This is a team made up of young adults. Some want to be treated like grown-ups. They're kids who are stuck inside and want adventure. Others don't want to grow up so fast. Because of their past trauma, they're stuck in a state of arrested development. And now all of them are thrust into a situation that makes them question their assumptions about responsibility and growing up. Okay, we all on the same page here? Good. I want Cassie to lampshade the Quantumania connection with the first line as the team comes to. Cassie gets up and says, not again, as everybody looks around. Where are we? The kids survey the land around them. This is not the quantum realm. It might even be Earth. Like, nothing's that strange. There's a grassy field, a blue sky. Maybe they're just in the wrong place. America tries to open a portal using some kicks and the sling ring, but neither work. Something's messing with them. My portals aren't working. Okay, it's fine. Riri, are you able to pick up any signals? It's all down. That shouldn't happen. I'm plugged into everything. Okay, we'll fly up and get a visual. Let us know what you see. Landmarks, civilization, whatever. Got it. Riri flies up. America looks around and notices something. Hey, where's the boy? Huh? He went through the portal. Shouldn't he be here? Where did Wanda's kid go? Oh, no. God damn it. We're lost and the boy is lost. Great plan. Had to make a choice and I made one. That's what leaders do. Well, look where it got us, leader. Hey, for all we know, he made it to Wong and they're about to come get us. Riri lands. I don't know about that. What do you see? It's, um, okay. There was a lot of nothing. Some forest and a castle. Okay, so we're in England or something. What else did you see? Well, it looked like, hmm, I mean, it couldn't be. What was it? 
It was... And a dragon flies overhead. The gust of wind knocks the team over. That. The team watches the dragon fly away, and then they notice all kinds of magical creatures in the distance. Centaurs, pixies, and America gets worried. Oh no, we're not supposed to be here. Where is here? I'm not even supposed to be able to get here. Get to where? We need to get out now. America, where is here? Avalon. It's the origin of all magic in the universe. What do you mean? Doctor Strange and you guys do magic. No, we channel it from here. That's what the spells and the relics are. They're all conduits. Okay, so then can we use magic to get home? Maybe, but I can't do any now, which means something's up. Back up. Why are you so scared of Avalon? Because magic is dangerous, which means the things that live here are powerful, more than anything we've ever seen. Well, did Doctor Strange tell you anything about it? Like, how does he get out? He doesn't. He's never been here. He's only read about it in books and heard some legends. Okay, we're gonna need to find that kid, figure out how to get home. Let's check in that castle you saw. No, we need to make camp for the night, scout out the area, try to figure out if the people in that castle are gonna help us or try to kill us. Do you know what lives out here? They're freaking dragons. We're safer taking our chances with them. Plus, they might have the boy. All right, listen, we can do both things. You guys stake out the castle, see if you can figure out who lives there, and if they're friendly, Riri and I will check out the forest and find somewhere to sleep for the night. Fine. Okay. Good. Everybody stay on comms, check in every five minutes or so. If we don't hear from you, we're going to send up a flare to get your attention, and then we meet back here. Sound good? Yeah. Let's go quickly. We don't know how much longer we have before nightfall. Young Avengers disassembled for now. And the two teams split up. This usually happens in these team-ups, makes it easier to film, and gives our heroes some alone time to either bond or fight or both. I want the two leaders in America to be on one team, while the other two characters stay behind. You'll see why soon. Now, I want to answer a question I have a feeling I'm going to get here from some of you. Why Avalon? Well, first of all, it's a new place. There are plenty of places left for the MCU to explore, but a lot of the rest of those are tied to a specific supergroup. The Savage Land, Krakoa, Mojo World, those are all X-Men places. Latveria, the Negative Zone, Subterranea, those are all Fantastic Four places. So I wanted to send the kids somewhere that wouldn't make sense to save for another team or character. Now, Avalon and Otherworld, the larger dimension that Avalon belongs in, are traditionally related to a very specific group of X characters known as Excalibur. But I don't mind playing with that here because we can use this story to introduce the world and even become familiar with some of those characters, and then when the X-Men show up, that team can form naturally. But more importantly, I picked Avalon for one reason. Because what connects so many of our young Avengers? Well, Wiccan does magic. Kid Loki does magic. America Chavez does magic. Also, Kabbalah wears a mystical artifact. So we have a lot of magic characters that fit on the Young Avengers. So let's take them to a magic place. And then our other characters that are left. Can you imagine how a story set in an Arthurian storybook fantasy land can find a use for an archer? Or a giant? Or a character in a suit of armor? Avalon just fits these Young Avengers specifically super well. And what we're doing here is basically a subgenre of the transported to a far off world stories. Ever since Mark Twain published A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court all the way back in 1889, there have been tons of time travel or dimension hopping stories when a person from our modern day is transported specifically back to King Arthur times. A Kid in King Arthur's Court, Black Knight, Army of Darkness, every time travel show ever made. So this is the best group from the MCU to send there. They have lots of abilities that can apply to these situations, but they're not experienced enough to be overpowered. Also, Otherworld happens to be another very important Marvel multiverse location. I don't want to spend too much time with it here, since the MCU already has all of its multiverse mechanics locked down, but the one very important Marvel multiverse player they have not established yet is Captain Britain and the Captain Britain Corps, who protect the multiverse. So maybe after Secret Wars is all done, they could be established by whoever is in charge here. So back to the story. So this is a fun place to work that friction between Kate and Kamala. Have them argue about what they should have done. And America's freaking out this whole time. She's scared because outside of that one time she was in prison in Multiverse of Madness, she's always been able to teleport. And she's felt extra safe with Strange and Wong. So being isolated from them has really gotten to America. Especially because she thought she was getting help from the actual Avengers. But these guys are not that. They're just kids who've never done anything like this before. And then Cassie and Riri get some time to talk. 
Cassidy talks about how scared she was last time this happened and she only felt safe because she knew her dad was out there. Now she doesn't even know if he knows she's gone and Riri is just tired of magic. I believe the pitch for her solo series is Riri a scientist goes up against a crime boss with magic weapons. Makes sense. That's an interesting challenge for her. So she hates magic the same way that Indiana Jones hates snakes. And Cassie can cheer Riri up. This is a trait I'm making up for these two. Let's have them both be kind of into D&D. Mostly Cassie, but Riri played once or twice. And if this Avalon is anything like D&D, Cassie knows where all the monsters are and how to beat them. This is 100% a lie. She sort of remembers some things, but she's just trying to keep Riri from freaking out. Kamala, Kate, and America make it to the edge of the forest to try to figure out what's going on in the castle. It looks peaceful. They see some knights guarding the entrance. A moat, drawbridge, the works. Then Kate notices something. A tower with blue light coming through the window. That must be where they're keeping the boy. Kate finds a wall that's poorly guarded, figures Cassie can sneak in, find the boy, and maybe he can help get them home. It's their best shot. And as they're about to turn back, they hear a horn and the drawbridge lowers, and a bunch of knights come out of the castle followed by an old man on a horse. Oh no, they've been spotted. The three run back into the forest and hide behind some trees, but the knights pass by. Whew. And then they realize the knights aren't after them. They try to warn Cassie and Riri, but the signal is jammed by some sort of strange interference. So they rush through the forest to where they expect them to be, but the knights get there first. Now we get a fun little fight between Cassie, Riri, and these knights. We'll learn a couple of things. The knights have armor that protects them from all of Riri's energy weapons. And it's all some version of red, white, and blue striped. Cassie tries that jump tap trick from Quantumania and it catches a few knights off guard. And she makes it to that old man, but before Cassie can grow and knock him out, he catches her in his hand. She tries to grow, but she can't. Then he does some magic and Cassie is trapped in a glass lamp. Then he turns his attention to Riri, who's doing a good job staying out of the knight's way. But the old man uses some more magic to conjure some crimson bands that fly up to Riri and ensnare her suit. She falls to the ground and the knights tie her up. And as she's being caught, Riri catches Kamala, Kate, and America getting to the fight out of the corner of her eye and shakes her head. No, don't get caught. Kamala wants to go, but Kate stops her. And they watch as the knights and the old man leave with Riri and Cassie in tow. Kamala, Kate, and America try to come up with a plan, but they're all panicking and it's getting dark. The woods get eerie. Eyes pop in and out of the darkness. They can hear things moving in the trees, but no one can make out what. One thing snarls, and it becomes clear these are wolves. And eventually, something humanoid begins to take shape. Kate draws her bow, Kamala makes a big purple fist. America gets into a fighting stance, tension, 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 and out comes a wolf woman. She gets closer and puts her hand up, signaling that she's not going to hurt them. And as the woman gets further from the wolves in the forest, she slowly transforms into what seems like her natural form. She's a human, sort of elfish, with huge long blonde hair. Seems to be in her mid-twenties, maybe thirties, wearing a green bodysuit with a black trim. She speaks to the kids. She introduces herself as Megan. She's a human, like them, but she accidentally got transported to Avalon when she was very young. She's been living here ever since with the rest of the forest creatures. The young adventurers explain that they got dropped here accidentally after a magic boy started ripping reality apart. They don't have a way to get home and two of their friends just got captured by the knights and some old wizard. Megan goes cold. What, you know those guys? They're the Knights of King Arthur, but they don't work for him anymore. Arthur takes orders from the old wizard, Merlin. Cut to the castle. Cassie and Riri are brought to the king, but he's silent. Instead, the wizard, seated behind the king, gets up and addresses the girls. I'm imagining someone pretty campy here, not quite Stanley Tucci in Transformers 5, but eccentric. I can see Ewan McGregor working well here on the younger side. And on the older side, someone like Hugh Grant, Colin Firth, Sean Bean, or even Jeremy Irons could be fun. I think previously I had suggested Daniel Craig for this role, but for convenience, let's go with more Gandalf. The wizard asks, what are you? Excuse me? It's confusing. My anti-energy lantern is designed to nullify magic, but I don't think that's what you are. I imagine your abilities have something to do with the arm you're wearing, but I can't risk you getting out, so why don't you just tell me? What are you? What do you think? I think you're one of those Avengers. I know Ant-Man is one of them. I assume you're related to him. And you're obviously an Iron Man kid, maybe Iron Lad or Lady or whatever. I'm sorry, there's so many of you, I can't keep track. How do you know about us? Starlight Citadel is a gateway to every universe. I like to keep up with what's going on, should I ever return. Where's the boy? He's a friend of yours? That's all we want? We'll leave you alone. Oh, you will. 
I'm sorry to tell you, the boy is dead. Cassie's somewhat upset. So you don't know him. That was a jest. He's alive and will stay with me. I know you don't want to introduce yourself, but I am a slave to manners. My name is Merlin. The Merlin. Like from books. Somewhat. They tend to exaggerate some details and leave others out, but yes, I essentially am the Merlin from your books. Is that supposed to scare us? Have you read the books? Heard what I've done? Not really. Okay, well, just assume you should be scared. What do you want? I shouldn't tell you this, but I get so few opportunities to speak with people from our world. What the hell? You know the story of my King Arthur, Sword in the Stone, Knights of the Round Table. Well, do you know how he died? I did. You see, I aided Arthur using magic and prophecies, and one day I saw the prophecy of his death, wounded during the Battle of Camelot. And I knew I would not be able to stop Arthur from fighting, so I researched, looked into every possible magical solution to save his life and noticed something. In all these ancient texts, I kept coming across one word, Avalon. It was the home of magic. There, perhaps, the magic of Avalon would be great enough to save Arthur. So I studied and read every text I could find to try to learn how to travel to Avalon, if it even existed. I heard legends of many potential doorways to Avalon, but they were either tall tales or the doorways had been shut off. I had failed. So the battle came and everything happened as I foretold. Arthur was beaten, sustained a mortal wound, all was lost. And as Arthur was dying, I went back to my research, looking for anything I could use to help him. And I found something in the footnotes of an old book, a location I had missed. We had one more chance. So we rode through the night. When we reached our destination, we said a prayer and stepped through the arch into Avalon. I healed Arthur almost immediately. And then I realized the magic in Avalon was far more potent pure, powerful, and someone like myself who was able to do so much with our magic could use the magic of Avalon and become, well, a god. So Arthur and I devised a plan to use Avalon as our personal fortress. We would create an unstoppable army using its magic and lead them into our world. However, getting out of Avalon was more difficult than getting in, as I'm sure you've noticed. We couldn't both escape, let alone bring an army through. I needed more power to open a gateway for that long. Then I saw a vision of the Wiccan, a being born of chaos and torn through the multiverse, one of the most powerful magical creatures to ever live. So I waited, and when he was traveling through your portal, I reached out and captured the boy. And once I'm able to harness his power, I will use it to destroy everything that stands between Arthur and eternity. Why are you telling us this? To put it simply, I'm bored. I've spent the last thousand years waiting. And Arthur is a great man, but lousy company. You don't want us to join you or anything? Hmm. Pledge your loyalty to Arthur? Become a knight? I don't see why not. We'll never join you. You see, that's why I didn't offer. Had a feeling you'd turn me down. I don't do well with rejection. I will say, I think your parents and mentors will try to stop Arthur. And sure, he's a merciful king, but when met with opposition, he will do what's necessary for Britain. So I would advise you join us if you want your loved ones to survive. I'll give you some time to think about it. I'd estimate you've got about a day before I'm ready. The guards take the girls away and lock them in the dungeon. Megan brings Kamala Kate in America to her hideout. On the way, she explains her story. Megan was born in our world. She had her power since birth. Megan is an empath with the ability to mimic the powers and appearance of whoever she is near. Originally, she had fur and people thought she was a monster, so her parents kept her inside where she watched TV and learned to control her powers. Then, when she was very young, five or six, Megan went on a trip with her parents. Something happened, she can't remember what, and she ended up in Avalon. And even though she is clearly an adult, somewhere in her 20s, Megan acts like a kid. Says she loves Avalon because she loves fantasy. It's like living in a dream world. The kids ask if she ever wonders about what happened to her parents, but Megan clearly doesn't want to talk about it. She's just happy to have new friends. So Megan is our Peter Pan here, the girl who never grew up. And she's going to teach some of our heroes that growing up too fast is a mistake, while showing others that sometimes you need to grow up. And maybe, like Peter Pan, this newfound family will help her accept that. They make it to the hideout that's populated by all sorts of magical creatures. You've got centaurs, fairies, pixies, and some humans. Leading the group are three figures. The first is Oberon, king of the fairies. The second is the Green Knight. And then the third, 
The group's leader is Roma, Merlin's daughter. I want to keep their designs somewhat consistent with how they're portrayed in the comics. Oberon is a big old monster guy. The Green Knight has been portrayed a couple different ways. Sometimes he's just a knight in green armor. Sometimes he's that but closer to Swamp Thing. The character is sort of an avatar for nature, at least in Avalon. So I think it's cool if he's got that overgrown look. And then Roma is just a young woman. Young compared to Merlin, so like 30s. And these three are leading the resistance against Merlin, defending Avalon and by extension the world from his conquest. This alliance is called the Tapestry, which is a little callback to a nickname Megan had on a trading card that didn't amount to anything, but also I think it's a cool name. And the Tapestry brings in our three young heroes. They say Megan is the only other person in Avalon who is from our world. So these three are special. Kamala shows them her power and right off the bat she's a big asset. And Megan can realize that Kamala's abilities are similar in nature to her own, so maybe Kamala and her share some sort of mutation. Da -na 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 -na. So Megan and Kamala hang out. America explains that she's an amateur magician and traveler of the multiverse. Roma takes an interest in that. America can also fly and has super strength, so she's also going to be a big asset in this battle. America also explains what's going on with the boy, and Roma is able to put together Merlin's plan to drain the boy of his power and use it to take over Avalon. Then there's Kate. She's already pretty down since she isn't much more of an asset than any of the tapestry's many archers, and she thought she was a natural leader but all of her decisions so far have led to catastrophe. So what is she good for on a team like this? Maybe this was a mistake. Maybe she can never be an Avenger. And the Green Knight senses this conflict within Kate and offers to help her. If you're familiar with the legend, Gawain is a knight who accepts a challenge by the mysterious Green Knight. The knight offers his axe to anyone who can deliver a wound to the knight as long as, in a year's time, the knight can deliver that same wound. Gawain, a hot-headed knight, eager to prove himself, beheads the Green Knight, which surprisingly does not kill the supernatural creature, and sets Gawain on a year-long quest that challenges his belief in honor, chivalry, mortality, and love. At least that's how the film frames it, and the film is great. The Green Knight can teach Kate that she needs to stop holding herself to an impossible standard, and accept the fact that she's not as powerful as some of these guys, and she might not be the natural leader she thought she was, but she can still be a hero this team needs. And the Tapestry has a plan. They're going to lead an assault on New Camelot that will distract Merlin while a small team sneaks into the Starlight Citadel and steals the boy back. Roma shows them the plans and Kamala notices the dungeon. Kamala also thinks they should try to save their friends who were captured by Merlin earlier. But Roma disagrees saying they can only focus on one, need to get the boy out to save the world. Heroes need to make tough choices. Kate and America agree but Kamala doesn't. After all, that's one of the lessons she already learned from Carol. You gotta try to save everybody. Down in the dungeon, Riri and Cassie hear a somewhat familiar voice. I see you had a run in with the wizard too. Riri sees Kid Loki. Whoa, are you some sort of kid Loki? Uh, just Loki. So they turned you into a kid with magic? No, I've always been like this. No, I've seen Loki. They taught us about him in history class. And theoretical physics. And poli -sci. He's older. I'm 600 years old. You look 12. The real Loki looks 40. But like a good 40. Kind of hot. Very hot. For a mass murderer. Now here's a good guy now, or that's what Thor said on Dad's podcast. I know which Loki you're talking about. That's one of the Lokis I met in the Void. There are a lot of us. It's complicated. Multiverse. I get it. I killed the Kang a while ago with my dad. No big deal. So how did you get in here? I don't know. What? He's tricking us. Okay. I have a guess. I'm assuming this is Avalon. I've been here for a few weeks, but no one's told me anything. Here's my working theory. Long before I was captured by the TVA, don't worry about it, I put in place a spell that would detect when anyone traveled from their world to Avalon and take me with them. I've always been curious about it, but never been able to get here myself. Then I got sent to the void, again don't worry about it, most of my magic was disabled. Eventually, your Loki, I think, did something to the leader of the TVA and took control of time, leaving all of the other Lokis and myself to roam free. So I was about to explore the universe when all of a sudden I'm thrust into this new realm and imprisoned by a wizard. I assume something similar happened to you. Well, we... Don't tell him anything. This could be part of the wizard's plan. Or his. I don't trust him. Fair enough. My guess is that something did travel from your universe to Avalon in the time since I escaped from the void and that triggered my spell. Maybe. Either way, we've got to devise a plan to escape soon. Can't figure out exactly what he's up to, but that wizard is preparing for something big. Then the tapestry begins their assault on the Starlight Citadel. Everyone under Roma's command goes straight for the front gate. They even have a fake covert team designed to be caught, led by the Green Knight. 
While that's going on and Merlin is busy, Kamala, Kate, America, and Megan fly up to the tower where the boy is being held prisoner. Roma figures, since Merlin might not know what the kid's powers are, they can use that to their advantage and hope he's not expecting them. The young heroes fly to the tower. America holds Kate and Megan holds Kamala. And the four find the boy hooked up to a bunch of batteries that are draining his power. Similar to the ones Hydra used to drain the power of the Cosmic Cube. Kamala, America, and Megan use their abilities to break the restraints holding the boy, and Kate is again useless. So she thinks and tells Kamala, I'm going for our friends. Kamala thinks about what Roma said, but gives Kate the okay anyway, and Kate zips down to the dungeon. She fights her way through a couple of nights and finds Cassie, Riri, and Kid Loki. Kate uses one of her explosive arrows to free Riri. She picks up the lantern holding Cassie and leaves Kid Loki, who pleads that she needs to rescue him too. He can be an asset. He's not the Loki they know. Riri and Kate sort of agree, but they're not sure. And Cassie tells them everyone deserves a second chance. Which, because her dad went to jail and had his big redemption arc, is something she would value. Kate uses her last explosive arrow on Kid Loki's cell, and he is freed. The other three manage to free the boy, but he barely has any energy left. He cannot help them escape. So Kamala makes a bubble that America and Megan are ready to fly away. They're just waiting for Kate and the rest of the team. They make it back to the tower, where America also objects to Loki, but Loki notices something. His magic's back. The boy must have been powering whatever Merlin was using to nullify everyone's magic, or at least his own. So Kid Loki immediately disappears. The group's angry, but it doesn't matter. After seeing Loki's magic work, America tries to open a star portal, but it's not able to open more than a few inches. Kamala asks, why doesn't yours work? America responds, I don't know, I guess teleporting's easier than portals. They get in Kamala's bubble and fly back to the base. Once Roma sees the kids are leaving the tower, she calls for a retreat. Oberon stays behind to hold off Merlin's forces so the tapestry can escape. And that is the midpoint of this movie. Our heroes are back together and they got the boy back but at a great cost. So they argue. Roma is angry at Kamala for waiting for the other two and risking the mission. Cassie feels dumb about trusting Kid Loki. Kate feels sorry for getting Kamala in trouble and extra sad because the Green Knight was captured by Merlin. And on top of that, the boy that they just saved is pretty much useless. The five heroes go to talk to the boy. Hey, I'm Kamala. This is Kate, Cassie, Riri, and America. We're with the Avengers and we're here to rescue you. Do you know where you are? No, I don't. Okay, so this part's gonna be tricky. You're in a place called Avalon. It is a magical realm that's the home of magic. Very Lord of the Rings. Okay. Do you know what day it is? Tuesday? Oh, sorry. You've been out for a little bit. Aw, oh, man. I missed something important. It's alright. We're gonna get you home. Do you remember who you are? My name is Billy. Billy Kaplan. I'm... This is where we're going to need to fill in whatever we learned during House of Harkness. But just working off of his comic history and what I expect that show to do, here's what it'll say. I'm a wizard, I think. I could do magic. My mom was the Scarlet Witch, but not really. It's complicated. Where's your brother? Brother? Yeah, Agatha didn't tell you. Original Billy had a twin brother. I don't know. Maybe he didn't get me or whatever happened to me. Okay, well what do you remember from the last few days? Not much. I was in Westview just at home and then I felt a strange sensation and now I'm here. I think someone punched me. Also, I think Loki was there? Okay, so we punched you, sorry about that. The Loki was some kid Loki? Don't completely understand what happened to him. Then a wizard named Merlin kidnapped you and drained your magic. He's gonna use it to take over the world. That's bad. Yeah. It's strange, you know, I could sort of feel my magic coming back, but I'm nowhere near where I was earlier. Okay, we can work with that. We need to take you to Roma, maybe she can help. But Rome is busy trying to figure out Merlin's next move. She knows he's planning on traveling out of Avalon, but nobody knows how he's going to do that. Like Merlin told Cassie and Riri, almost all of the doorways into and out of Avalon were closed a long time ago. Apparently one existed back when Merlin came into Avalon, which was also probably the one Megan used to get into Avalon, but Merlin never told anyone where that was and Megan forgot. So if they want to stop Merlin, they need to figure out where he's going. But even if they find Merlin, they don't believe they have a real chance against him. He's incredibly powerful, and he will be commanding an army of superpowered knights and corrupted versions of Oberon and the Green Knight. It'll take all of Roma's magic to keep Merlin busy, which means the kids, Megan, and the rest of the tapestry will need to take on Arthur and his army by themselves. So this downtime is where we do some more character stuff. This is where Kamala and Kate can reconcile, admit that they both wanted to lead the team and weren't listening to each other. 
I want Cassie and Megan to talk about their parents. Cassie can convince Megan that if they make it out of here, that she'll come with them and find her family. Kate can tell Riri how she wishes she could design cool stuff like Riri does and Riri could help her upgrade some of her arrows. America and Billy can talk about Multiverse of Madness and Billy's mother. America wants to make sure Billy hears that his mother really cared about him from someone who's not a witch. Kate notices that America is still pretty scared and asks Billy if he can use his magic to make something. Billy says he can try and produces a box. Kate opens the box, shrugs, and goes over to the other kids. She says, I know whenever I feel down, one thing always cheers me up. She opens the box. Pizza. But inside, there is not a normal pizza, but a bunch of pizza balls. Billy tried his best, but magic's hard. But America gets really excited because, as we know, she loves pizza. Eating makes her feel comfortable in a new universe, and pizza is familiar. So the gang shares the pizza balls, and they start talking. Kamala says, I feel like we're missing something about Merlin. Okay, well, wherever he went, he seemed to be able to get there by horse. So this place is probably in England. Yeah, but how are we going to find a specific arch in a country filled with castles? There have to be a billion of them. Yeah, but it's got to be older than most castles if Merlin read about it in an ancient text. Hold on a second. What did you say, Riri? How are we going to find one arch in a country filled with castles? What do you mean, arch? He called it a door. No, he said he was looking for a door but he used the word arch to describe what he stepped through. They're the same thing, right? Archway, doorway? Maybe they're not. But what kind of arch isn't a door? Then it hits Megan. I remember. That's where we were visiting when I got lost and ended up here. It must be the last remaining doorway into Avalon. What? Stonehenge. No. Well... Selvig did go crazy there a couple of years back trying to study different dimensions or something. Maybe he found the door, but he just didn't know what it was. So the kids tell Roma and everybody goes to that door for the big Act 3 fight. I don't have too many specifics I would need to see here. There are really only two moments I think are necessary. But imagine you can figure out most of this. Hawkeye does some stuff with archers. Stature fights the giant. Stuff like that. I'd also like a simple arc for Riri where she accepts magic. Like maybe she's pretty distant from Billy and Megan. But then perhaps during the final fight we could get a moment similar to Thor juicing up Iron Man. When Riri realizes that Billy can power her suit with magic. Giving her the extra energy needed to take out a lot of the knights. But the two big things. First one, at a critical moment when the good guys are being overwhelmed by Merlin's army. They notice the enemy army getting scared hear a big noise, and then Kid Loki comes from behind the good guys, flying on the dragon the kid saw earlier. Then he radios the team using that earpiece Kate gave him and says, You missed me? Where did you find that? Saw him when I came in. Thought it might be useful. How did you tame it? Trick I learned from your Loki. Plus, I've always gotten along well with reptiles. Why don't you tell us what you were doing? I knew it would take time. Didn't have a moment to lose. The dragon rips a hole through the army. Plus, I'm a sucker for drama. Now go, Merlin's nearly finished. And the six young Avengers, Roma and Megan, run to Merlin and have one last standoff. And for the last big move, I want the team to huddle up, and Riri asks, Okay, Kate, Kamala, what's the plan? The two think and say, Cassie, what do you think? Acknowledging that Cassie is actually the best leader for this team, Cassie thinks for a second and says, Kate, don't take this the wrong way, but Merlin won't think you're a threat. What arrows do you have left? A shock arrow, goo, a couple of regular ones, and a pin particle arrow I can use to make something grow. I've got an idea. Riri, can you reverse this? For sure. Also, Kate, you remember that move you were talking about yesterday? Kate gets excited and agrees. Who's the fastest? I am. Okay, America and Megan come with me. America and Megan break from the group. Okay, I need a portal back to camp, but I can only make little portals. Everybody looks at America. Oh, right. America punches a small portal. Cassie shrinks and goes through one of America's portals to camp. She grabs something. We don't see what it is, but it's small enough to fit through the portal. So she brings it back to the group and hands it to Megan. Megan, you take this. Hang with us. Wait till the second arrow. Okay. The rest of you, I need a distraction. Riri, Kamala, and Billy make a big stand against Merlin. Riri shoots at Merlin to get his attention. Kamala shields Riri when Merlin shoots back at her. Billy comes in with a big energy blast, and Merlin catches all three of them in big vines. Okay, so I was not originally planning to do this, but I realized I had such a clear picture of how this last bit should go. I called up Alexander Duran, the artist who worked on storyboards for the channel before. You've seen him in my Ant-Man 3 pitch, my Thunderbolts pitch, and I asked him to storyboard this bit out for me. So again, Merlin says, You children are really getting on my nerves. Then from behind, Merlin hears, 
We're young. It's what we do. He turns and sees Kate, America, and Megan. Kate has her bow drawn. Ha! <laughs> do you know how much power I have? You're gonna shoot me with an arrow. Something like that. Then Kate whispers, You sure about this? And we pan down to see a small Cassie holding onto the tip of Kate's arrow. Yeah, Hawkeye. Let him have it. Kate shoots the arrow at Merlin. In slow motion, we can see that it is right on target. Merlin lazily puts up a shield in front of him that the arrow is going to hit. Kate tells America, Now! And America makes a portal that the arrow flies through and comes out behind Merlin. And as Merlin is turning around, Cassie jumps off the arrow and goes giant, punching Merlin and sending him flying. Then we see Kate shoot another arrow. This one hits Merlin and he shrinks. Then Megan catches Merlin in the magic proof jar Merlin used to imprison Cassie. And Merlin is caught. His army disappears except for Arthur who is caught by the Green Knight who is back to normal. The team stands over Merlin as he yells, You can't do this. You're just children. Cassie says, Buddy, we're Avengers. Kid Loki lands near the rest of the team. Cute line, but we need to go now. Megan says goodbye to Roma, and the team, including Kid Loki and Megan, rushes to the portal, but it closes in front of them. I'm sorry, I don't know if I can open it again. I've exhausted my magical energy. Billy, can you? I don't know how. Let me try. What? Give me your power. How is that going to help? Well, to put it simply, I'm better than you. Don't take it personally. I've had a 600 year head start. I can use the spell I used to get in here on all of you, and then I'll leave and you'll all be pulled through. I can't trust you. Oh, come on. Everyone deserves a second chance. Cassie nods. Even though technically I didn't do anything wrong that you know about. Let's try it. Billy holds Kid Loki's hand and transfers some of his magic to Loki. Loki says goodbye to his dragon, gives it a helmet resembling his own. Then Loki does some magic at the Young Avengers. He opens a portal, steps through, and disappears. A beat... Nothing. Damn it, I really thought, and suddenly the kids are pulled through the multiverse and land in a field. Riri is holding a note that says, You're welcome, regular Loki. The kids get up and look around. They see some tents and people in old timey clothes. A knight rides up to him. Oh, come on. The knight lifts up his helmet and says, Whoa, are you kids okay? Yeah, you wouldn't happen to have a phone we could use. The knight says, What is this phone you speak of? Everyone looks a little worried. Then the knight points to a sign with a cell phone crossed out that says no modern technology. Everyone groans. Then the knight sees a kid holding a Nintendo Switch and rides towards him saying, What devilry is that? Turns out Kid Loki dropped him off at a Ren fair as a joke. Then we get some falling action. America portals everyone back to the Avengers base where they find Vision, Wong, and Ant-Man. They're all worried. Cassie hugs her dad. What happened to you guys? It's a long story. America makes a portal back to Kamartaj that she and Wong walk through as she says... Someone's gonna be jealous. And then I have three post credit scenes. First one, the kids are looking through Fury's tablet for other possible young Avengers. They pass T'Challa, too young, Love, too far, and Scar, I don't know if we're ready for a Hulk. They land on someone and Kate looks at it and says, Strength, speed, and a shield, he can work. And we see they're looking at Eli, they keep looking and America says, Wait a second. And everyone stares at the tablet dumbfounded. And Kamala says, Hey, Billy, why does this guy look just like you? Then we see the profile for Tommy Shepard. Second possible post credit scene. Roma is sitting in the Starlight Citadel with the Green Knight and Oberon. Oberon asks, How is the prisoner? Roma says, As usual, short-tempered. Oberon laughs. The Green Knight asks, If I may, my magistrate, I was wondering, what we do now? We may need our own hero to protect Avalon from future threats. Roma says, I've been giving that a lot of thought. My father's idea, the knights, it wasn't bad. His mistake was, he went for quantity. I prefer quality. And a man comes out in the classic Captain Britain costume. We don't even need to pick an actor since he wears a mask. And then Roma says, but why not both? And then a bunch of Captain Britons walk into the hall. Roma has created the Captain Britain Corps. Then the third post credit scene. We're outside a restaurant. Billy walks up. Camera stays on Billy the entire time. He's dressed in normal, somewhat fancy clothes and nervous. Billy wipes some sweat from his forehead and walks inside. He sees someone at a table and sits down. The guy says, You made it. I'm so sorry. You wouldn't believe the week I had. I hope so. It's not often I get stood up and ghosted and then the guy calls me back. 
It was a very, very weird emergency. I can't guarantee it won't happen again. It's just kind of my life. Well, next time, just text me. I will. Hey, speaking of that, I have you on my phone as your full name, but is that what you prefer to be called? Then the camera swings around. We see a bigger blonde guy who says, you can call me Teddy. That's the last post credit scene. Then that's the movie. We have a young Avengers team that had a fun adventure in Avalon and is ready to work together to solve new problems in the future. Speaking of working together, I want to talk to you about this video's sponsor, Nebula. You guys know Nebula. It's a fantastic subscription streaming service that I helped to create. A bunch of other YouTubers you probably already know and love are involved. Patrick Willems, Captain Midnight, Scott Niswander, Leo Vader. It's a who's who of people who talk about movies on the internet. There's a lot of other kinds of people that talk about politics and science and all kinds of other cool stuff. But if you like videos like this, there are a bunch of other people on Nebula making similar stuff. But also, Nebula is not just making videos about movies. You probably heard me talk about Patrick Willems' feature film, Night of the Coconut. Abby from Philosophy Tube's play called The Prince, which you can watch on Nebula. We've got Jesse Gender's Identities coming up. But there was just an announcement about a new Nebula film that I think is super cool. This one is also from Abigail from Philosophy Tube, and it is called Dracula's Ex-Girlfriend. This was just announced, like, today as I'm recording this. Apparently it's got a Jennifer's Body, Euphoria, My Dinner with Andre vibe. It seems very cool. And it is set to debut on Nebula in summer 2024. So boom, cool thing just announced on Nebula today as I'm recording this for the first time. And there's all kinds of cool stuff like that that we're constantly doing different series, longer versions of videos, extra videos. There's all kinds of great stuff on Nebula. My Nando V Movies videos all go on Nebula early and ad free. Now my Nando Cut videos are uploaded to Nebula the same time as they go on YouTube. So if you want to watch them, they're here too. And not only is it a steal at $5 a month or $50 for a year, if you use the code NANDO at checkout, N-A-N-D-O, you can get Nebula for right around $2.50 a month, which is $30 for the entire year. We also just recently brought back our lifetime memberships. It's something we're constantly experimenting with. Apparently people really like it. What it is, is it is $300 and you get access to Nebula for as long as you and Nebula continue to exist. And we, Nebula, have no plans to stop continuing to exist anytime soon. Now, I bet you're wondering, Wait, you said it was $30 a year, so this is like 10 years, 100%. This is not like the best value version. That is definitely still the $30 a year version of Nebula. This is more for if you, A, just like having lifetime memberships, not trying to do annual subscriptions, which I totally get, and or B, you want to support Nebula original programming, because this is the best way for Nebula to fund some of these bigger projects without trying to you know, go out to investors or venture capital or people like that. So if you're interested, if that's something you like as of right now, lifetime memberships are a thing you can still buy. I have no idea how long the lifetime memberships are going to be around for, but the yearly Nebula subscription, that's not going anywhere. So feel free to use that. Either way, go to go.nebula.tv slash Nando. Use the code Nando at checkout. Watch all my videos early. Watch all our Nebula exclusive stuff. And let me know what you think of the video. If you are part of the Nando View Movies Discord server, we have a channel that's just for talking about the Nebula video. So as the Nebula video goes up, everybody watches it there, and then we talk about it. So again, go.nebula.tv slash Nando. I hope you enjoy it. I think you will. As always, huge thank you to everyone who continues to support the channel on Patreon. And thank you so much to Alexander for putting together those awesome storyboards. Everybody go follow me, Superman Duran, on Twitter. Thank you to everybody who watched this video early and ad-free on Nebula. And everybody that follows me on Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, all that stuff. I'm Nando V Movies on all those platforms. That's all I got. Stay safe. I'll see you next time.